To trace the history of this briefly, I'll go back to 1997 to an example that I think many of us are familiar with now, which is there were two films from Hollywood that were made about Tibet that cast Tibet in a very sympathetic light, casting Tibet as a victim of Chinese military aggression. Seven Years in Tibet with Brad Pitt and Kundun, a Martin Scorsese film for Disney. Both of those production studios, so Columbia TriStar and Disney, were then immediately shut out of the Chinese market. And that was like an earthquake across Hollywood. And in the past 26 years, there has been not one, not one major Hollywood film that has crossed CCP red lines at all. And now The Good Fight with Yasha Monk. Here is another installment of the contents of my new book, of The Identity Trap, a story of ideas and power in our time. As ever, please do consider reading along week by week as I summarize these chapters in my own words. I have been trying to explain how the identity synthesis could escape campus, how it could go mainstream over the course of the last decade. This has something to do with the way in which a popularized form of the identity synthesis started to form on social media and enter newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post. It has something to do with a short march through the institutions in which students steeped in these ideas on campus started to take jobs in corporations and nonprofit institutions and pressure their employers to pay heed to their ideas. But the final turning point came ironically, in the form of Donald Trump's victory in 2016. One of the really interesting realizations I had in researching this book was looking at the literature on group psychology regarding dissenters. It turns out that most groups are pretty tolerant of long-standing members criticizing their direction, saying that they're doing something wrong because they give them the benefit of a doubt. They think that they have the group's best interests at heart. But that ceases to be the case in study after study under conditions of threat, under conditions when the group thinks that its most fundamental interests are threatened from the outside. At that point, they stop being tolerant towards internal dissenters and even treat them worse than external dissenters sometimes, accusing them of being secret traitors, of being in league with the enemy. This started to happen in many progressive spaces after Donald Trump's election, which did create genuine conditions of threat, which made many people afraid for very rational reasons. At first, the protests were directed against Trump, with millions of people going out in the street against him, hoping that some deus ex machina was going to remove him from office. But as that failed and people started to understand the powerlessness, they increasingly directed their energies towards purifying the moral community of which they themselves were a part, directing their ire against anybody who dared to speak up against a rapidly forming set of new progressive orthodoxies. There's a great anthropologist who wrote a paper in the 1990s called How Come That the Enemy of Humanity Always Turns Out to Be in the Office Down the Hall. That is what a lot of these progressive spaces felt like in the late 2010s. You saw this in the institutions that tore themselves apart, especially after 2020, making it much harder to pursue the often important and noble missions. And you also started to have intellectual enforcers of these ideas. Two are particularly important. Ibram X. Kendi shaped a Manichaean vision of anti-racism in which you either get on board with his exact political program or you are on the exact other side. If you're not an anti-racist as he construes it, you are for him a racist. There's no such thing as simply being not racist in his thought. And the second was Robin D'Angelo, another author whose book uh, topped the bestseller list 
in 2020, who construed any form of resistance to her Manichaean worldview as a sign of your white fragility, of your defensiveness, of the fact that really you are just trying to uphold a system of racial domination. Taken together, these two popular pseudo-intellectual precepts perpetuated the idea that you had to be fully on board with all of the new progressive norms and principles, lest you wanted to be accused of secretly being exactly the same as reactionaries like Donald Trump. That concluded the pinnacle of the popularized, the vulgarized version of the identity synthesis. And one of the things that has become clear to me in researching this book is the mutual influence, but also the great distance between the set of ideas I talk about in the first part of the book and this form of a popularized identity synthesis. I can take very seriously the ideas of Michel Foucault and Edward Said and Gayatri Spivak and Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw, even though I have some significant disagreements with them. I think it is much more important to criticize forthrightly and to attack some of the popularized version of the identity synthesis, which came to be so powerful by about 2020. And so in the next part of the book, I go on to think through these applications to really try to understand how they have reshaped popular assumptions about topics from free speech to cultural appropriation. Please consider ordering the identity trap, a story of ideas and power in our time, and follow along as I give you my argument against these increasingly popular assumptions. My guest today is Bethany Allen. Bethany is the China reporter for Axios, as well as the author of a really interesting new book called Beijing Rules, How China Weaponized Its Economy to Confront the World. We talked about the nature of a Chinese economy, trying to understand the mix of capitalism and state control, how to make sense of it and what that might mean for the country's ability to escape the middle income trap. We talked about the ways in which China is trying to impose its rules on other countries, including putting very strict limits on the freedom of corporations and individuals in Western countries to criticize the country. And we thought a good bit about what kind of steps we could take to preserve that freedom of speech. And finally, we reflected about the country in which the two of us originally met, which is Taiwan, trying to understand the upcoming elections there, as well as what prospects the territory has to defend itself against the CCP's ambition to take it over. Bethany, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. You've been reporting on East Asia for a long time. You've spent a long time in China. You're now based in Taipei. How has China tried to rewrite the rules by which the world operates and make its influence felt as its economic power has been growing over the course of the last decades? Well, what I write about in my book is how the Chinese government has made its economy into its primary form of power projection over the past 25 years. And I expect for the Chinese economy to remain China's top source of power around the world for numerous years to come. A key concept I, I write about in my new book is called authoritarian economic statecraft. And what I mean by that is the way that, actually quite innovative ways, that the Chinese government has found to 
have these very targeted controls on access to its economy, its markets, its capital, and its investments in order to shape the behavior and decision-making of governments, multilateral institutions, individuals, and companies to bring them more in line with the Chinese Communist Party's core interests. So perhaps before we really can understand how China does that, we have to understand some basic things about the country's economy. And I'm sure that every listener to this podcast will know that the country has had a very impressive development over the last 30 or at this point 40 years, that it has gone from a country with a huge percentage of its population in severe poverty to uh, an economic powerhouse, arguably the biggest economy in the world by some metrics, and a country that sustains a huge affluent middle class. The model of the economy is not clear, though. I mean, the country claims to be communist. It's clear that in many senses it is using a market economy, in some ways a quite competitive and brutal market economy. And yet the state and the Communist Party in particular play a really important role in structuring this economy. So what is this? Is this capitalist? Is this communist? Is this state capitalism? Is this something else? How should we actually think about the basic nature of the Chinese economy? It's definitely not communist, and it's not really socialist either in any sort of conception of that term. What the Chinese economy has been since the 90s is a some version of state capitalism where there's major state-owned industries, state-owned enterprises. The Chinese government owns or has control over major kinds of assets like you know minerals and mining and the railroads and such. But there's been a very big and, and very vibrant market economy and private sector in, in other parts, other sectors of the economy. But what we've seen in the past 10 years, especially under Xi Jinping, is a model that some scholars are now calling party state capitalism. And I really like that term to describe the way that the Chinese Communist Party sits over the economy. And party state capitalism, this is not communist style central planning. This isn't like some committee in Beijing deciding how many widgets, you know, some factory in like Zhejiang province is going to make, you know, this year. It's not like that. Party state capitalism means that the, the party has these selective and very highly focused levers of control over many aspects of the economy from 10,000 foot level controls down to the decisions of individual companies. But a lot of the times the party doesn't touch those. It doesn't, it doesn't control what they do, but it can if it wants to. And what we've seen over the past 10 years is that the party has really made these controls much more, almost like laser focused, has made more of them, has extended them into more sectors of the economy, into more levels of the economy. And so some examples of that would be insisting that private companies have Chinese Communist Party cells embedded in them and in the company leadership. And having the United Front Work Department, which is a bureau of the Chinese Communist Party, be more involved in private enterprise. And also punishing, uh, making examples out of companies that for whatever reason they, they get unlucky and something gets posted online about something they've done or something, an example gets made of them. And that's kind of a there's this phrase in Chinese to kill the chicken to scare the monkey. And so other companies look at, you know, the example that was made of this company and they're like, wow, we better take a very, very wide swath around that kind of behavior. And so it's a kind of an informal control there. And then also, you know, Xi Jinping has really focused on something called rule by law, which is strengthening China's legal system, taking practices that were maybe just kind of inferred and making them de jure and having just more laws to codify more behavior, but oftentimes to enshrine the supremacy of the party's political power. So what does all of that do? What does all of that mean? That means that the party, when it needs to, at, at sort of crucial moments, it can come in and direct parts of the economy in one way or the other, either for some economic restructuring or for domestic political reasons. And a good example of that would be 
Xi Jinping's crackdown on the tech sector, on this very vibrant tech sector, which he felt was perhaps getting too powerful, that there were companies that were getting too powerful. And so he was able to come in through China's regulatory agencies and other ways and break apart some companies and kind of tame that sector. So that would be, I think, the best framework that's out there for understanding the Chinese economy while still understanding that there's still freedom of decision making a lot of time for a lot of people. So that's a really helpful framework. I'm trying to understand the advantages and the disadvantage of this. When I was briefly in Shanghai earlier this year, I met an economist there who teaches at Fudan University and whose argument is that China has been able to grow so rapidly and is more economically efficient because it has a third coordination mechanism. That whereas in Western market economies, you have ways to coordinate by contract, you have ways to coordinate by the mechanisms of demand and supply, but that's it. And that in China, you have a sort of third coordination mechanism through the Communist Party and the Chinese state, and that allows you to somehow be more efficient or to pursue social goals better. And you can see how a benevolent and competent state might intervene at certain points and say, this company is getting too big, let's just smash it. It might say, here there's something that perhaps by the existing laws is legal for this company to do, but it's obviously causing huge social harm. Let's step in and stop the company from doing that. But of course, for every time that the state will get that right, it might also get it wrong. And for every time that it fights back against a company because it genuinely is causing social ill, it'll be tempted to do so for reasons of maintaining political control. It can found these party cadres within particular companies, and that might work sometimes. But at other times, it'll lead to those being promoted, not being particularly competent, but merely being loyal. So how efficient is this system? In what ways does it provide advantages? And in what ways does it provide disadvantages, which may help to explain some of the current challenges of the Chinese economy? Well, I think that I personally wouldn't want to overestimate the efficiency. I'm not really sure if I were like describe effects of China's party state capitalism. I'm not sure efficiency is the word that I would use because, yes, as you said, that for every one that's every intervention that's done well, there could be one that's done poorly. But also there's also a big space for just like corruption and factions and people with more power than others that can sway that government or that party decision making as well. So it may be the company that, that's getting investigated or the, the one that's not getting investigated just had better friends in higher places. Right, the political patron happens to have a favor of a court right now versus happens to have fallen out of favor with a party. I'm not really sure that that element of it is efficient. I mean, I don't think that Xi Jinping is responsible for China's economic miracle. That had all basically already happened by the time he came into power. And there was a lot more political freedom, both, I guess, socially and politically and economically before Xi Jinping. So I think to answer the question about China's economic miracle, I think we would have to look to the 90s and the 2000s when I'm not really sure that you could really call it a model of party state capitalism. And also we're at this point reaching beyond really my area of expertise. I'm not really in a a super good position to go into like details on what are the causes of China's economic miracle. Yeah, I mean, perhaps we can just note, and I certainly know that literature less well than you do, that in a strange way, there's a debate about the causes of China's economic miracle. And then there's now an inverse debate emerging about the causes of China's current economic troubles, which is to say that the sort of classic account of why China rose in the 1980s is that it adopted the market and it allowed a billion very entrepreneurial uh, people uh, desperate to rise out of the poverty that most of them suffered to use their ingenuity to trade and to create new products. And and this sort of provided the basic engine of China's economic growth. And then there's, I think, some revisionist accounts that say, actually, the state was more involved in this. Perhaps it was a mixture of some market elements and clever state planning. And that's the sort of more left-wing view of how China was able to rise. I think in an inverse way, you could either look at this particular moment and say, you know, China continues to be this incredibly efficient country. They're going through an economic crisis right now, but everybody does. And the reason why they are seemingly outpacing the West is that they have uh, these state coordination mechanisms and the party is so involved in the economy and so on. The other way you could put it 
is that no, in the 90s and 2000s, there really was a very strong market element. And the more the state has re-encroached on the economy, the more it has turned into this form of party state capitalism, the less efficient it's turned out to be. I don't think that we can resolve those two questions, but perhaps it's just helpful to note that, as I understand it, these are sort of two oddly inverse debates going on about why did China rise in the 80s and 90s and so on, and then why does China seem to be in some amount of economic trouble today? I don't think that the Chinese model is particularly efficient. I think it's more just very large. If you look at the GDP per capita of China, it's nowhere near Europe or the U.S. What we have seen, though, is that the Chinese government was able to get out of the way enough, which I think personally is an achievement of a government to be able to do that. I've heard some people say, oh, this, you know, the CCP can't take credit for China's economic miracle for its amazing economic growth because all that it did was just stop interfering in people's lives in the 90s and stop interfering in the economy and just sort of let people do what they want. But that's, I think, just totally wrong. That's not how free markets are built. Free markets are built by government action. They don't disappear out of nowhere. And I would give the party a lot of credit for that. I don't think it's particularly efficient, but I do think they've just created a lot of money, which when you have like now, you know, 1.4 billion people, you end up with a huge economy. The CCP had done exactly what it has had done and had exactly the same, you know, enormous growth rates, but sat over a country of 100 million people. We would not be having these conversations or these podcasts because it just wouldn't matter as much. But it is just a, you know, sort of a function of their enormous population that it seems, I think, so, so, so astonishing. And I definitely very strongly disagree with, I mean, I've been seeing a bunch of these op-eds over the past couple of months that, like, what's the fundamental problem with China's economy right now? It's political. No, it's not. I think that's, I think that that is just like American knee-jerk neoliberalism needing it to be that. But I just don't think that's the case. I mean, what it is, is just that sometimes economies grow through massive growing pains. And there's no economy in the world that's ever escaped that. It doesn't matter what your political model is. What did happen? Like, what's the cause of this? It's two things. It's China's development model that it, that it you know, got a lot of um, development out of for decades running out of steam. So what was that development model and how was it running out of steam? Their development model was basically like manufacturing and export on the one hand, China as the factory of the world. And then on the other hand, it was basically since the Great Recession was infrastructure building domestically. And what that looked like was, you know, the Chinese government in 2008 had this enormous and ongoing stimulus where it had really preferential like lending rates for developers and local governments. And so there was it was like an infrastructure power GDP growth to insulate China's economy from the financial recession and then to keep on powering this economic growth. And that continued for years and years. And, and you know, there were predictions for years that, that this created a huge real estate bubble, that this couldn't last, and it lasted far longer than anybody expected. But it does really seem finally to be, that bubble seems to be bursting. These are normal problems. I don't think any of this is a function of like too much government intervention, because if the government hadn't intervened, then the slowdown would have happened sooner, right? So it, it's, it's, it's far more complicated than that. Can I suggest a middle interpretation or a middle path? And you can tell me why that's wrong. I'm fully conscious that you're much more expert in this than I am. Sure. No, another way of putting this is that most countries end up being stuck in the middle income trap. And one of the big questions about China was whether it was somehow be able to evade that middle income trap. And one of the reasons why people thought that it was going to be able to do that is these slight sort of fantasies about how efficient China is. Why do we keep using the word efficient? I, I just don't think the Chinese economy is efficient, and I don't think that's a big argument that people make. I agree with you. So the point I want to make about the efficiency is I think there's this sort of like adversary efficiency bias. So I'll give you a very different example of this, but I think I've mentioned a podcast before, and I was just speaking talking to David French about this, and he thought that I had come up with this, and I thought that he had come up with this, so I think we somehow cobbled it together between us. The way I remember it is that David French talking about, you know, he used to be a con firmly ensconced in sort of conservative political circles, and, and and all these conservatives would get together and say, my God, the liberals, you know, they've got it together. They have all the money in the country, you know, they have the big foundations in the institutions, they really coordinate, they know how to fight. We're just a bunch of disorganized 
people squabbling amongst ourselves and being really inefficient, right? And then he started to be in more liberal spaces and more progressive spaces, and he realized they had exactly the inverse narrative. They were like, oh my God, we don't have any money and we don't know what we're doing and so on. But the Koch brothers and everybody on the right, they really know what they're doing and they have this master plan for how to like have influence in America and if only we were like them, right? And so it's just very easy to sort of project this onto the other side. I mean, I was struck when I arrived in Shanghai, I was using a transit visa, which allows you to be in the country for, I believe, 144 hours without getting a visa in advance, which was difficult at the time because the country had only just reopened after COVID. And people are very nice and friendly. They're completely thrown by this. They clearly hadn't encountered a transit visa in a long time. And it took about an hour to get into the country. It wasn't sort of terrible, but it's just, it was not an efficient process, right? I mean, people like didn't know what on earth are we supposed to do? And they had ran back and forth and seven people conferring with each other about how to deal with this visa situation, right? I agree with you. What I was saying is, I think that there's been this weird swing in Western perceptions of China, where five or 10 years ago, the story was the Chinese state is so efficient and so brilliant. They've really figured it out. And so now we've gone to the opposite of that. But actually, I would say what we're seeing is China struggling with the middle income trap, perhaps for having fallen into the middle income trap, perhaps they're going to be able to get out of it. I, I don't know what the answer to that is. But in most situations where there's a middle income trap, this is my middle interpretation, there is a political element to that. Right In most countries that end up getting stuck in the middle income trap, bad political incentives and political structures that work well in the growth phase that then actually start to favor certain insiders over outsiders are a big part of that. So you could think or you could argue that China's particular political structure and incentives are part of the reason why the country is getting stuck in the middle income trap without somehow saying this proves that China's political model in the economic sense, is especially defective, right? This may just be an element of how most countries end up getting stuck in the middle income trap. And the reason why whatever other country is getting stuck in the in the middle income trap may be a different set of political reasons, but, but the politics may still be important. I think the opposite is true. First of all, I don't think that China is going to be stuck in the middle income trap. And, and, and second, I think the reason that it's not going to be stuck in the middle income income trap is because the Chinese government intervenes in the economy in a, in a helpful and long term way. So let me tell you specifically what I mean. And I can talk here about Xi Jinping. So, you know, Xi Jinping had basically, you know, more or less nothing to do with the Chinese economy getting to the size that it is, but he is going to have a lot to do with getting the Chinese economy out of what, what would have been a middle income trap. And that is what he has been focusing on basically for the past 10 years. And what that looks like is you have to transition your, your job as the head of a developing nation that doesn't want to get stuck in the middle income trap is to transition it into some sort of higher, you know, a higher level economic production, right? You have to have new, uh, new sources to fire to fuel the economy. And so what Xi Jinping has done for the past 10 years are things that you know, let's say Republicans in the U.S., but, you know, traditional economists will look at it and be like, oh, look at this inefficiency. Totally, you know, this is, you know, so bad. So lots and lots of government subsidies of certain industries would be a, a huge example of that. So I, I, let's, look at, let, let's look at electric vehicles and, um, and also China's industrial policy. So subsidies and industrial policy are, have been, up until maybe two or three years ago, were, were basically four-letter words for, like, classical economics. So basically everyone, everyone in America, um, you know, sort of a consensus on this, that this is, it's, it's inefficient, it's bad, it's going to, it reduces innovation in the long run, it will reduce competitiveness, and it's just a, you know, it's terrible policy. But what the Chinese government has done is choose certain industries that it believes will be, that will be key industries to in the future of the global economy, like solar power, like electric vehicles, and then the things that you need for electric vehicles, like certain, um, you know, certain minerals to build batteries, special batteries with. And for years now, years, I mean, a, a decade almost, the Chinese government has given massive subsidies to its solar panel uh, manufacturing industry, to its electric vehicle industry, and created mass inefficiencies, very obvious inefficiencies, especially in the electric vehicle industry where you had all these startups flush with all these cash. Plenty of them were, were um, basically frauds, just get, you know, like getting all this free money and you're getting a bunch of investors because they looked fancy. But what happened in the end is that the Chinese EV industry, because it was it was it was 
powered by, you know, such amazing, incredible assistance, the Chinese government essentially at first created a sort of a, not a fake market, but a, a supported market for EV vehicles in China. But now, as of this year, that market, the domestic EV market in China, has begun to function. There are enough vehicle makers now. There are affordable cars um, that work well enough, and there are so many of them, that Chinese consumers have actually started to make market-based decisions to buy EVs. And it's projected that in uh, 2023, um, EVs will be uh, 25% of all car purchases in China. And that is without any kind of consumer end subsidy. And you know, Chinese EV makers have started porting all their you know, cars everywhere. And, and on top of that now, the Chinese government has basically and locked up the main sources uh, around the world and of the minerals and, and other, you know, what there are that you need to make, so that you need to make batteries for EVs. Lock, thus locking out other companies uh, from from other countries, and so they they basically brute force their way into into true economic competitiveness and true dominance. China is going to be the new Japan when it comes to exporting cars around the world in about five years. And so I give this as an example, and you you can take this and repeat it across maybe four or five other major industries in China to say that this is what you know Xi Jinping has been doing as his plan to get China out of the middle income trap, and I do think he will be successful. So I agree with you that the story of EVs is really impressive. And as you're saying, it's partially that they are now competitive with non-electronic vehicles domestically. But it's in good part that China has gone over a very brief span of time, as I understand it, from being a uh, you know massive importer of cars to a net exporter of cars. And it looks like that trajectory is likely to continue. So I guess when you look at the Chinese economy, there's a kind of complicated mixed story, right? Where on the one side, you have the country be able to be competitive or to be a world leader in really important industries in a way that was not true of most places that got stuck in the middle income trap. So it's obviously true of electronic vehicles. It's obviously famously true of artificial intelligence, but it's true of, you know, all kinds of other areas as well. On the other hand, there seem to be these structural features of the Chinese economy that a lot of economists are, are worrying about, right? The fact, for example, that the country seems to be saving more than it's consuming in ways that create a problem for internal demand. I mean, the problem uh, that you alluded to earlier in terms of the centrality of infrastructure and more broadly housing in the Chinese economy, which is a model that now seems to be running up against its limits because you have all of this housing built, you have, as a result, tremendous debt, including debt of municipalities that were involved in this. You have some of the biggest real estate companies having trouble paying back their loans. And then you have uh, an interesting phenomenon of, of very high youth unemployment. I was very struck when I was speaking to this economist from Fudan University that he was saying his own students were having trouble finding jobs. So this is, you know, economic students at one of the most fancy universities in the country. And I, I had heard about youth unemployment before, but I thought, you know, that's a problem for a lot of people, but probably not for the for the elite. And it sounds like at least at this moment, that seemed to be a problem for the elite. So, and then sort of fourthly, you know, we're talking about whether it's a communist or a socialist country. One of the very obvious ways in which it's neither communist nor socialist is that it still hasn't really rolled out a welfare state for most citizens, there's elements of one. It's improving relative to the past, but in a striking way, some of the basic forms of social safety net that, that you can take for granted, even in the United States, continue to be absent in China. So I think your argument is very persuasive that China is going to be able to be a leader in some of these industries. To what extent will it be able to deal with these other structural challenges that still remain and where perhaps some of the political incentives make it hard to do that in ways that, again, I would say is not sort of particularly to do with the Chinese thing, but just changing those kind of models is just incredibly hard because the existing model gives incentives to insiders to perpetuate them. And so brute forcing that change is a very politically complicated and risky process. Yeah. And, I, and I think that that is uh, in part by, you know, Xi Jinping. I don't know if he would have been able to do some of this if he hadn't consolidated power early in his first term, because he did have to push through a lot of this. Oh, to your question of kind of what is this going to look like, I mean, this is not a, a perfect analogy, but, uh, but I think a good way to view it is people in real estate, like when is that whole sector going to recover? I, I don't know. 
think about the U.S. You know, so when did when did the manufacturing, domestic manufacturing boom in in the U.S. in certain sectors? You know, I don't know. I'm not very good on U.S. history, but like 50s, 60s. You know, when was the end of the like the union jobs and factory towns and all this? You know, this this ended. I guess I would say the 1970s probably was the beginning of that. And so then what you get is, I mean, has the U.S. economy continued to grow since the 1970s? Oh, yes. <laughs> like, you know, now we have Silicon Valley. Now we have you know, our economy, which is we were already by far the most powerful economy in the world in the 50s, 60s, 70s. We are, and we're still, you know, we've still had enormous growth. But what did happen? The whole sector, the whole, the whole town, the whole squad of people got left behind. So wealth kind of changed hands, if you will. So some parts of the economy died and other parts really took off. And I think that's what we're going to see in China. It's not that the whole thing is going to stop chugging along. It's that parts of it are going to get left behind and other parts are going to just experience, you know, amazing growth. And that's complicated. You know, what will that look like socially and politically in China 20 years from now? I don't know. But, you know, I, you know, really put me down for the China will not get stuck in the middle of the trap kind of things. That's interesting. And I think it's great to hear a case for that. I mean, I guess I could say, look, the United States is sort of remarkable because its worldwide share of GDP has actually not declined in 30 years. So even as Asia had this incredibly rapid growth, the United States on a global level has kept pace. But that's not true of other countries. I mean, Japan's global share of GDP has declined significantly over the last 30 years because its economy stagnated as that of others increased. And the global income share of GDP of most European countries, Western European countries in particular, has declined steeply. So in Italy, for example, you had this great economic boom in the 1950s and 1960s and early 1970s. It was a booming country. It had actually many world-leading brands. And then it just really did not figure out how to change its model. And the country is now, has basically not had any growth for 30 years. So I guess, I, I guess I'd just say you can use the United States as a metaphor or you could use those other countries as a metaphor and your conclusion is going to be different depending on that. So perhaps China does have better conditions for various reasons than Italy or Japan. And I, I can think of a number of reasons why that might be the case. But it seems to me like those different trajectories are possible and figuring out which of those it's going to be is really hard. That is true. I mean, I think it's very, very difficult to know. It's very, it's very, very difficult to know how things are going to end up. We will reconvene in 30 years when we're both old and gray and hopefully wise and we can we can pass this conversation review. But I want to get back. I know we were on a very long detour. We now, have, I think, have a better understanding of the current state of China's economy, of some of its strengths and some of its challenges. So how then is China using its economic might and the influence that the Communist Party has over the economy to incentivize countries around the world and businesses around the world to play by its rules. Yeah. You know, speaking very, very simply, what China has done has create a kind of a sanctions regime, not sanctions, you know, not U.S. style, not, not in the kind of way we're used to thinking about it, but a different kind based on access to its economy. Now, that access is, you know, what are, what are the gates there? And those are all these things we've been talking about, the way that the Chinese government can, can, can you know, control any part of what's happening inside of its borders, you know, with almost laser-like precision sometimes. What they communicated very, very clearly for about the past 26 years is that if companies or governments or multilateral institutions or certain individuals cross certain red lines in their speech or behavior, they are taking a very big risk, that the risk of getting shut out of China is high. doesn't mean it always happens, but we all know. I mean, what an extraordinary PR campaign that every CEO of every company in the world that has interest in the Chinese market, they know that if they tweet a photo of themselves with the Dalai Lama, they're going to lose millions, if not billions of dollars, like instantly. It's really, it's really quite incredible how consistent the Chinese government has broadcast this message and the number of examples it has made of, of companies and governments. To trace the history of this briefly, I'll go back to 1997 to an example that I think many of us are familiar with now, which is there were two films from Hollywood that were made about Tibet that cast Tibet in a very sympathetic light, casting Tibet as a victim of Chinese military aggression. Seven Years in Tibet with Brad Pitt and Kundun by a Martin Scorsese film for Disney. And both of those production studios, so Columbia TriStar and Disney, were then immediately shut out of the Chinese market. 
And that was like an earthquake across Hollywood. And in the past 26 years, there has been not one, not one major Hollywood film that has crossed CCP red lines at all. That's especially extraordinary considering that in 1997, the Chinese economy was about one-tenth the size of the U.S., nothing like the economic juggernaut that it is now. And even more astonishing is that the box office, the Chinese box office in 1997 was, was negligible. There was not money to be made there. And neither of these films really lost any significant amount of money by not being shown there. Not just the film, those films themselves not being shown there. It's that those production companies themselves were, were basically banned. But even so was such a powerful measure that for the next 26 years and counting, the Chinese Communist Party neutered America's most powerful uh, instrument of soft power. And it wasn't even because of actual money to be gained at that time. It was merely on the promise of future riches. And that is something that the CCP has continued to build on with great consistency and uh, increasing scope and scale with greater frequency and across a growing number of topics, a growing number of red lines, if you will, is such that as of today, so almost codified that it, it is like a global sanctions regime that is highly effective against anyone or anything or any country that is trying to make money in China. So what's remarkable about this in part is the one-way nature of that, right? I mean, I presume that there's all kinds of Chinese movies that portray Americans as the bad guys or that do things that American audiences would find offensive. But of course, America does not therefore ban the products of whichever conglomerate owns the production studio that made those movies, right? If you're concerned, as I am, about culture of free speech in the West, about how we actually retain our ability to do things like portray critically Chinese rule and influence in Tibet or in Xinjiang for that matter. Is there anything that free societies can do without sacrificing their own principles to stand up to what you're describing as this effective sanctions regime? How, if we want to make sure that Hollywood writers can write movies that depict the world as they see them rather than being cowed by the fear of the executives, is there stuff I can do? One idea I had, and I think it's a very limited idea, and I've written about this publicly after, I forget if it's, I think the owner of an NBA team was put under significant pressure for criticizing China, is to have better protections in general for free speech of employees of companies, but in particular to, to bind those companies. So in the same way in which you deal with corruption by saying, if you work in certain markets, people are going to demand bribes, but you know what? If you bribe them, this is a crime under U.S. law and your executives might go to jail and so you better not do it. I wonder whether there's ways of binding companies to say you cannot fire employees for, in the private capacity, criticizing states around the world, including China, but not limited to China. So that might be a little way of binding the hands of companies and that might sort of help make sure that at some point China either has to ban all of these Western companies, which presumably it doesn't want to do and it can't do, or it has to tolerate that kind of free speech. I think that's a very limited step, but I wonder what other kind of measures we could take domestically to ensure that we evade this sanctions regime, that we don't accept those de facto limits on what you can say within the United States, within Germany or France, because of this growing economic lawfare from China. I like the way that you think, and I'm, I'm very glad that you're thinking about laws and regulations on companies, because I, I think that that is the way to go. Uh, you know, a big chunk of my book is a critique of, of neoliberalism, or whatever you want to call it, you know, this in, a global embrace of a too lightly regulated capitalism, in my view. And that kind of thinking has really stunted our ability to respond to the CCP's use of economic coercion in this way, because our sort of knee-jerk response is, oh, that's not something governments can do. We can't do anything about that. We can't do anything about that. And it limits us to civil society responses, such as naming and shaming companies, which does not work. In this case, when it comes to China, that does not work, because the incentive for them to continue to self-censor amidst even a U.S. domestic you know, media uh, firestorm is so great. If the share of you know, profits we make globally from China is something like 20 or 25 percent, it would take an enormous domestic consumer rebellion to rival that, right? Yeah. Or like U.S. domestic consumer boycotts, 
or something like this. And, you know, Americans are, are just not going to care about Uyghurs enough. You know, like they're just not going to care about Tibetans or the South China Sea or Taiwan or Hong Kong or even a lot of things like that. Or even when something, when it, when it touches more closely on actual American lives, like the pandemic and the, you know, the, the narrative around the origins of the pandemic, it's never going to be something that really brings Americans out onto the streets like this until China starts like literally bombing us. You know, it's just not going to, it's not going to rise to that level. Well, on the Chinese side, there's such targeted pressure against companies so that it's not just the money that they're feeling. It's this asymmetric, this imbalance of pressure that they're feeling. So yes, I think that, and as I you know write in my book, the way to go about this is to view companies as responding logically to the structure of the market, which is simply the way that the U.S. that are thinking has conditioned companies to act. People are taught in you know business schools and just the way that, that we run things is make profits wherever you can without breaking the law. That's it. That's how it works. And what we have failed to do is to pass laws to prevent, you know, to protect companies from making immoral decisions in this sphere. If we want to change their behavior, we have to change the, the incentive structure. Here's another thing, you know, if we're leaving, you know, so you talked about Daryl Morey, you know, the managing, uh, the manager of the Houston Rockets in that tweet, or, you know, any of these other companies like Disney or uh, Marriott or any of these companies that have faced this kind of pressure from China. What we have currently and still to, up to today, when something like that happens, is you have the world's largest authoritarian government and the world's largest authoritarian party versus one individual company. Of course, that government is going to win every single time. I think it's unrealistic for us to put CEOs on some kind of moral pedestal and say, well, of course you should, you know, lose a hundred million dollars so that people can tweet things. You know, we don't hold ourselves to that standard. Why should we hold CEOs to that standard? So what we should do is, and, and I'll go into some of my specifics. I, I have 14 different recommendations in my book and I can mention a few of them here. What we need to do is to regulate, pass laws regulating company behavior. But it's better not to look at that as regulating company behavior. Rather, what it is, is, is it's elevating company behavior and pressure from China to a government-to-government -government level. When it's government-to-company level, that is not a contest of equals. But if you pass a law, you know, the U.S. government passes a law that pushes back against this, if that elevates it to a, a government to government level, and that is a contest of equals. What are some potential regulations that we could put in that, that would not go, you know, you can't, in the US, here's something we can't do. We cannot pass a law requiring company employees to tweet in support of the Hong Kong protests. Of course, we can't do that. What can we do? Well, here's something we could sanction several of the top Chinese companies that are most responsible, that are, that are most complicit in creating the architecture of censorship inside of China. So Baidu, Tencent, etc. And what that would do, among other things, is create a halo of deterrence around the idea of complying with foreign government censorship. And if you're all familiar with, with sanctions and how that affects business decisions, it creates something called a halo of deterrence which is, you know, companies take a very wide berth. You don't want to get anywhere close to the line that gets your company into very serious trouble. That's right. You don't want to get anywhere close to that. And so if you, have, if you sanction these companies, not only would it, of course, prevent any U.S. companies from... Which is, by the way, this is very incidentally part of how random cancellations over trivial things on social media work, right? Because individual examples may be rare, but they're very visible. And so you don't know where the line is, but you don't want to be anywhere close to it. And so we start self-censoring. From the Chinese side, it's way worse than that because there's, you know, it's there is like such a, you know, it's not just like random mobs. It's like conscious government policy. But um, yeah, no, you're right. So it creates this halo of deterrence around the idea of complying with foreign government censorship. That's now there isn't a single sil silver bullet to solve this. What you need is is lots of different things in place that together would push back against that. I like your idea. In my book, uh, I have a couple of sort of similar ideas. One of them is strengthening unions and uh, especially in like tech companies, which have very, very weak unions, if any at all. And also, along with that, strengthening protections for private whistleblowers. And this is, if you, for example, uh, look at what happened with Google a few years ago, when Google was creating a, a bespoke censored search engine for China called Project Dragonfly, they were doing that secretly. And, and it was a secret within Google 
so secret, in fact, that it subverted the company's own ethics procedures in order to push it through. And what happened was eventually uh, some employees leaked this to the press several times. Once it became public, then many, many company employees were very upset. There was a lot of internal pressure against it. Some employees were threatening a walkout. And I remember at the time, there was a, like a GoFundMe page that was set up to help support these employees in case they lost their jobs because there were no other protections for them. And I think if, if you're relying on GoFundMe to protect your democracy, I think you know, there's something kind of missing there. So, so along the lines of what you're saying, having more protections for employees... I think, uh, and also similarly, you could, there could be a law. There actually was, uh, there was a draft law introduced a few years ago, maybe 2020 in Congress. It didn't go anywhere that would have, if it had passed, would have prohibited companies from firing employees due to censorship demands of foreign authoritarian governments. So I think, you know, kind of a set of these things could go in that direction. And that's important because it ties the hands of companies, right? I mean, this is, I think, a general principle when we're thinking about, as we have been last weeks or months, when should universities make statements? If you adopt something like the Calvin Report uh, made by the University of Chicago, you have a principled response to why don't you issue a statement about the cause that I care about, which is, this is always going to be a competitive zero-sum game. It's not a helpful business for universities to be in. We've adopted a principle, which means no matter how much I might care about this cause, no matter how much I might be upset about it, we've adopted a principle where I can't, right? In the same way, a company asks you for a bribe, you say, sorry, Foreign and Corrupt Practices Act. If I do that, I go to jail no can do. And the same way you're saying, look, China demands to the CEO that you fire a particular employee who said something on Twitter in order to have access to the market. You say, I can't do that. No other CEO in America can do that. And by the way, we've coordinated with our European partners and they're not allowed to do that either. So you're just not going to be in luck. My hands are tied. Yes, exactly. You, you get it exactly. This is actually very pro-company. I really hate the idea that regulation is bad for companies. These are pro-company ideas because this would empower companies when they are when these unreasonable demands are made of them. They can go you know, to whatever Chinese government authority is, is making this demand and say, hey, look, we would love to comply with this. We totally would. But look, here's the law. Right. I'd love to do nothing more than fire this person who sent the outrageous tweet. You know, I, I, I would love to do it sadly. Yeah. We can't. That is what we want here. It is not reasonable to expect companies to sacrifice themselves to become martyrs, you know, for like some, you know, theoretical something when no one else is doing it. It's not reasonable. And I also think that opt in codes of conduct are nonsense. That's just not, you know, overwhelmingly, that's not going to work. This is this is what governments are for. This is what regulations are for at a very deep level to protect the fundamentals of our democracy and of freedoms. We've talked a lot about companies, but this, you know, the China's economic coercion is also highly focused and targeted at government decision making. And it's also very effective at influencing government decision making for exactly the, you know, in exactly the same way. And if you look, for example, at at South Korea in, in 2016, the South Korean government said it was going to install a U.S.-made missile defense system called THAAD to strengthen its defense against North Korea, but China didn't like it because it could theoretically be used against China as well. And so China adopted a bunch of these, you know, very vague and opaque sweeping sanctions against South Korea's economy at the time. And what's super interesting is that just a couple of weeks ago, there was a report from Reuters looking at how that has affected, very deeply affected, South Korea's very definition of what national security is and what South Korea's interests are. So there was a South Korean marine technology company that was uh, had signed a, a deal to provide submarine parts for Taiwan's indigenous submarine project. And Taiwan is a democracy. South Korea is a democracy. They're both very U.S. aligned. Taiwan having indigenous submarines is great for South Korea. And, you know, clearly this is well within South Korea's national interest. However, the South Korean authorities actually arrested the CEO of the South Korean company and fined the company. Uh, And in the affidavit of that um, arrest, arrest warrant for the CEO, they said this behavior, this deal with, uh, with Taiwan violates South Korean trade law because it jeopardizes South Korean national security 
because it could cause China to retaliate against us the way that they did in 2016 because of that. They cited Thad in that affidavit. And so they were actually forcing a company or they were they were actually shutting off an area of cooperation that in the long run is definitely good for South Korea's national security. And they were going the opposite direction because of the, because of economic coercion. There seems to be a parallel because for here we are more on the government to government level. There's a lack of cooperation coordination within non-Chinese entities to stand up to it. I mean, another example that made some waves in Germany is that the city council of Heidelberg, a university town in the southwest of Germany, decided to fly a Tibetan flag along with some other flags outside the city hall. And China came down really hard on the city of Heidelberg in various ways. It had various levers to punish the city. But there wasn't solidarity among different German cities or different international cities, right? So how here, I guess it's not your answer to the first set of problems was to elevate it to a government-to-government -government level. Here, it seems to be, the, the structural problem seems to be more that you have to elevate it to all of our governments versus the Chinese government level or something like that. Yes, exactly. So in this situation, what needs to happen is there needs to be multi, better multilateral cooperation and structures in place. And there's a lot of different ideas now about different ways to go about doing this. And there it's, it's a, you know, it's a both and not a either or for this stuff, but one type of idea is you can call it an economic NATO or an economic mutual defense treaty or something like this, where you have countries that get together, they f have something somewhere in writing where they say, look, if one of us is the target of Chinese government economic coercion, here are the measures that we will take to support each other. And that can be emergency assistance to the sectors that are affected, and or it can be punitive measures against China. And that kind of thing, while extremely difficult to put together, especially in our, our current politics, I mean, you know, try to imagine the U.S. leading on something like that. And, and then, you know, the next time a, a Republican is elected, they could just shred it. Anyway, don't have to go down that trail there. Um, but, you know, having that, it would be great for when these things happen, but it would also be a powerful deterrent to China, right? To say, look, you can try this. And every time China does this, it has a it has some kind of economic cost because they they are able to you know somehow communicate to their companies and their sectors, hey, you know, don't export there, don't do this. That has costs, you know, inside of China, and maybe those are made up sometimes through you know subsidies provided to the Chinese companies that are affected. But th this has costs. Yeah, the interesting thing about the broader structure is that the Chinese economy needs trade with the West or with non-Chinese countries as much as the West needs trade with China. It's just that China is willing to use its economic might in a disproportionate way. Yeah, and I think they've been so successful because the you know, democratic countries have been so unwilling to band together um, against it. And I think, you know, as I've said before, part of that is the structure of how we view economic behavior, uh, you know, how we think it should be less regulated, how we think we should not coordinate because that is somehow bad or will inevitably result in um, inefficiencies. It's the very entrenched nature of, um, you know, corporate finance and our campaigns and, you know, pro the probate, the business is being a probate lobby. It's a whole host of things. Anyway, so that's one idea is a kind of a, you know, economic defense mechanism. Another one, and this is something that Victor Cha at CSIS has come up with, is on a more ad hoc basis, go going back to South Korea. Now, South Korea's economy is far, far, far smaller than China's. And if you were just to take one economy versus the other, you know, China's obviously going to win. But if you look very, very carefully and you, you know, research very carefully, you can find certain individual products or, you know, individual you know, very sort of, you know, targeted things where right. this Chinese sector or this, you know, Chinese supply chain is, is actually 95% dependent on this one product from South Korea. And so Victor, Victor Cha at CSIS has done that research across democracies, including like New Zealand and Australia and the US and lots of even small countries and come up with a list of these items to say, look, The next time the Chinese government does this, like, you know, pulls a Lithuania, where they do secondary sanctions on Lithuania for improving their and unofficial ties with Taiwan. These like-minded countries can get together and say, okay, look, we're going to stop, you know, we're going to pull this one, this one thing where 95% of, you know, this one Chinese su supply chain is dependent on this one product. We're going to, we're going to shut it down. And if you can get seven or eight countries to do that for that one ad hoc thing, 
it's uh, it's easier to do that. You know, it's hard to get countries to sign onto a life a lifetime commitment to something. It's easier to do this in the you know this this one tariff on this one thing. So that's another idea. You know, on the global scale to help when this is targeted at governments, government decision making. That's fascinating. And part of how China is able to have this disproportionate influence is that it is able to inflict intense pain on specific parts of the U.S. Western economy. And so this is retro-engineering the same kind of thing, right? To say, we're not going to be able to or want to inflict massive pain on all of China's economy, but we can make it really painful to this particular sector in a way that's going to be a pretty strong deterrent. One important topic has come up a couple of ways in an oblique manner now, which is Taiwan. Clearly, a lot of this fight is about Taiwan indirectly. And there's a big set of questions about whether and how the Communist Party will try to realize its ambitions of gaining control over Taiwan in the next decade. There's speculation about everything, uh, including a military invasion. My understanding is that you believe that something like an economic blockade would be more likely. What, what do you think are the other scenarios here? What does the next 10 or 15 years hold for Taiwan? I'm not optimistic about the future of Taiwan, unfortunately. There's an enormous amount of talk about a military invasion scenario. And as I've said before, I think we have far too great of an emphasis on that. Um, I don't think that China needs to invade to take Taiwan, and I, I don't think that they will do that. I think I think it's quite unlikely um, because, as I said, I don't I don't think they need to. I mean, a military invasion everybody can understand, and we've seen a precedent for it in Ukraine, including, uh, thankfully, ways in which that might turn out to be more complicated than invading countries might imagine. But what is the alternative? I mean, you have a population in Taiwan that has real political divisions, but uh, which does not want to be reunited with the mainland under CCP rule, the number of people in Taiwan who want that is very small, and you have a growing share of the population who hope to have genuine independence at some point in the future. So how do you bring a population like that, an island like that, under control without straight-up military means? I think that the the most likely scenario is, is some kind of a blockade, an, an economic blockade, at the right moment. And what would that right moment be? They would need to have... Number one most important thing is actually, I would say, the U.S. So the CCP would need to choose the moment at a time when the U.S. is not going is not going to have, be able to really commit to some kind of intervention. Pres- if a U.S. president is in power who is, for example, of the this kind of neo-isolationist strain that we're seeing in the Republican Party right now, if Who's the guy, Vivek Swaraswamy or something? Who, what's his name? Vivek Ramaswamy. Vivek Ra- yeah, Ramaswamy. Now, he's not going to become president anytime soon. But if someone like him were to become president, you know, he clearly views Taiwan as, as dispensable, I mean, d- disposable, basically, as soon as we don't need its chips anymore. If someone like that were president in the U.S., that would be, you know, basically a green light to China. So I get the international context, and I obviously agree with you that China's predictions about how America might respond are going to play a big role in shaping its strategy and its tactics about when to implement the strategy. But but before we get that, what would a blockade look like? I think for people who haven't fought through this issue, what does that what does that mean and what's the mechanism of coercion? I mean, are you basically cutting off food and fuel and basic necessities to the island in the hope and expectation that people will eventually surrender? Does that lead all the way up to effectively starvation? I mean, what would the goal of this blockade be? So I said the most important international factor would be the U.S. But the other important factor would be who is, who's the president in Taiwan? Who's, you know, who's leading there? There are questions about, you know, would the, would the KMT be willing to fight, you know, a war with China? Well, let's put that, you know, let's not think about that right now. But what if, a I don't know, a fairly spineless KMT president is in power and you have an economic blockade or some kind of blockade? Let's just say an energy blockade. Let's be very specific. Let's say an energy blockade. Taiwan is an island. It has 11 days of energy reserve. That's it. Just 11 days. So they're, they're very, very dependent on uh, oil and gas from abroad. And so energy blockade, day number 12, things shut down. The life support systems start failing. The country grinds to a halt. And China comes to the president of Taiwan with 
a few demands, not change your name to, you know, Taiwan province of China, but smaller demands, you know, like let us establish, let, let us open a military base or just give us control over your foreign policy. Just shut down your ministry of foreign affairs. Everything else stays the same. Just shut down your ministry of foreign affairs. Give us control of your foreign policy. And, it's, and uh, also the reins to your military, but you can still ha- keep having elections. Something like this that isn't a full, you know, a, a full handover. And that the president of Taiwan could be like, you know, could tell the, the populace, look, peace in our time. <laughs> We're sacrificing this small thing, but we have assurances we can, our, our lives can continue as before. Our economy will not suffer. You guys will be okay. We'll have energy again. It'll be fine. And then it'll be, and then China can just pull a Hong Kong. From that foothold, they can just strip away more and more and more. I think that this is a very realistic scenario and one that we should be talking about a lot more. Yeah, I was just going to say, it sounds like once you've established that foothold, when you play the Hong Kong playbook, which is over the course of 25 or 30 years, having demonstrated that you are effectively the person who holds the power, you dismantle whatever freedoms remain uh, one by one. Well, but, but you know, it happened a lot faster than that in Hong Kong, though. So there was a handover in 1997. And, and by probably 2002, 2003, the economic incentives for Hong Kong's elite had become so powerful that the Hong Kong business elite were all very pro-Beijing, and Hong Kong's elected assembly was was totally stacked in their favor. And it, it took, like, really extreme conditions and, ex- like, extremely effective organizing to overpower that. But I, I would I would expect it to be faster. I would expect, you know, in Taiwan, in this scenario, it would be more like with the speed that we've seen with the Hong Kong national security law within a couple of years. There is an important election coming up in Taiwan. And having spent a little bit of time in Taiwan this spring, I I can sympathize with how complicated it is to understand Taiwanese politics for outsiders. You mentioned the KMT, which is the abbreviation of Kuomintang, uh, which was the party that had been in control in all of China before the communist revolution, fled to the island of Taiwan and ruled the island for for many decades before the advent of democracy in Taiwan. Now, ironically, even though this party was forged in important ways during a civil war with a communist party, this has now become, through a series of historical developments that that I find fascinating and I'm not sure I entirely understand, the more pro-CCP party. So within Taiwan, it is the KMT, the historical grand enemy of the Communist Party that has started to be more sympathetic to the interests of Beijing. And part of the reason, I believe, is that it ended up being the governing party and therefore the party of the elites. And so when there's economic interests to cooperate economically with mainland started to open up, this party ended up favoring it. Now, on the other side, there's the DDP, the Democratic Opposition, which started as a democracy movement, which started in protest against the dictatorial rule of the Kuomintang, who are much more drawn to some form of genuine independence for Taiwan, who feel less Chinese and more Taiwanese, certainly among the voters. Now, these two parties are in the middle of a very consequential race for who will be the next president. You expressed the fear that a KMT president might make it more alluring for China to blockade the island because we might think we're going to be able to get concessions from that KMT president. On the other hand, there's the argument that some people are making that a DPP president who is more overtly hostile to the interests of the CCP might provoke Chinese action more. That the mechanism here would be, you know, as long as we have somebody ruling Taiwan who doesn't want to push towards independence and who we can kind of deal with, we don't need to act. But if the island is governed by somebody who uh, does have uh, some kind of aspiration for eventual independence, even if they are not moving on it right now, and is much more hostile for us, well, then this is a problem that we need to solve right now. So I guess it's, it's very hard for me to assess from the outside which of these outcomes is more likely to buy Taiwan time. Do you think that a Kuomintang president or DDP president is more likely to provoke this kind of geopolitical crisis over the course of the next five or ten years? That's a great question. And uh, I don't know. My general answer to this kind of question is that there is uh, more or less, it doesn't, that it doesn't really matter. I think that what has changed is that 
Xi Jinping has determined that, you know, he probably, he has probably determined that he wants to bring Taiwan back to the mother country while he's uh, in office. And I just don't think it really matters what Taiwan does or doesn't do. I think that the CCP has plans for anything, for any kind of outcome of the election or otherwise. And I think that they, yeah, they have, they just have plans no matter what. Um, And I know that that sounds like kind of defeatist, but Taiwan is a small island of 24 million with a, you know, kind of pathetic military and China's country 1.4 billion with the world's second most powerful military. And I just don't think that there's a lot that Taiwan can do by itself. I think what matters more is what China does and what the U.S. does. So I want to emphasize that we met when I was in Taiwan and you're living there. And I think we're both incredibly fond of of a place. And for me, it was an an interesting lesson in I, for political reasons, had cared about Taiwan. One of the important things about Taiwan, I think, is that it gives the lie to certain culturalist arguments, that there's something in the Chinese culture or the Chinese character that is incompatible with democracy, which is a claim that some defenders of autocracy in China and elsewhere are making. When you go to Taiwan, which is very much influenced Han in ethnicity and very much Chinese in history and culture, for some of my friends that might bristle at that statement, you recognize that this is simply untrue, that Taiwan is as much able as any other country in the world to sustain an incredibly vibrant democracy and an incredibly free society. With a strong side of slave labor, with a strong side of slave labor, I have to put that in there. But it is overall uh, a very vibrant democracy. You'll have to explain to us what that is in a moment. But just to say, for me, being there made it less abstract. I cared about Taiwan before, but after having spent time there, it just becomes that much harder to say, oh, well, you know, 23 million people, let, let them just be a pawn in geopolitics. What is that relative to seven or eight billion people? And I think that's a way that people sometimes talk on the right, but also on the left, a way of abstracting away the interests of people and countries who happen to be in a geopolitically unfortunate position and say, oh, well, they're just sort of these in-between territories. I, I, I want to emphasize that that's not how I feel, and I don't think it is how you feel. But therefore, if you think that China has basically determined to bring under Taiwan under its control, and ultimately, whether Taiwan has a government of a, of a uh, Guomingdang or a government of a DPP is not going to matter so much. What is it that outside forces and what is it that the United States can do to deter China taking that action? Or do you think that that is not possible either? No, that is. The U.S. absolutely can deter China from from taking you know whatever measures it wants to take Taiwan. I think the U.S., and I think that is the only reason the U.S., uh, that Taiwan still exists, is because of this strong deterrent from the U.S. You know, we... Technically, we have a, you know, policy of strategic ambiguity. You know, we don't say if we would defend Taiwan in case of an attack. And some people think that's a better deterrent, and some people think that's not a good enough deterrent. But the fact is that that is obviously a deterrent. And I think that, you know, the U.S. US support for Taiwan uh, and our our credible support for Taiwan. So, you know, if if we, you know, if our political situation continues to deteriorate into something more severe, I think it would reduce, you know, the credibility of our of our deterrence. But anyway, I think I think the single most important factor is uh, US deterrence and um, primarily military deterrence. So, you know, if there were some kind of an economic blockade, like the question would be, you know, let's say that there is, the question in Congress and in the US would be, do we intervene and perhaps start a, a war with a super, with a nuclear armed superpower over a conflict in which zero people have died so far? That's that's a difficult thing to say. Yeah, let's do it. Sign me up. Yeah, that's hard. But it's not impossible to consider that we would do that. But it, it maybe it would be if you know if we're um, you know totally bound up in a bunch of other problems. Yeah. So, I mean, so there's all this focus, you know, on the, this belief that the outcome of the election is so important for Taiwan's future. And I, I think what I wanted to say was that this particular election is interesting because there are two. Uh, independent candidates, in addition to in, in addition to the the DPP candidate William Lai and the KMT candidate um, Ho Yui, and because of that, it's it's pretty hard to predict which way the election will go. I don't think it's likely that one of the independent candidates will win, but it's also hard to say you know which votes will they pull more from the DPP or the KMT. That's kind of unclear. There's one thing that I think has been pretty, uh, just from my experience living here and talking with people, many Taiwanese people are really sick of the two, of both of the two main parties. They're sick of them. 
That doesn't mean they're not going to vote for them, but people really want a change. And I, and that is what, when these two independent candidates, the reason we're seeing them, the reason they're, especially one of them is polling with pretty high numbers is because of how sick people are of the, the two. It's not a two-party system, but it's functionally a two-party system. And in that way, it reminds me a little bit of the 2016 election in the U.S., in that it ended up in a way that people hadn't predicted because of this discontent, this latent discontent. I, I do see that in Taiwan, but it's that's what, that's about domestic issues and other things. It's not that particular sentiment isn't a referendum on the party's um, stances on China, but it could certainly affect you know the outcome of the election and the outcome of, of Taiwan's policy on China. The the KMT. So I you know I've done um, some reporting around you know the KMT's current platforms. And it, it's, you know, I think the this idea um, that, you know, that the KMT had that we'll just try to be friendly to China, be nice to China, you know, and we'll just kind of hope to continue this status quo forever. I think that worked great. That was a totally great policy for like the 90s and the 2000s. Well, the, it wasn't really functional in the 90s, but like the 2000s and the 2010s even, early 2010s, I think was okay. But this China is not that China. You know, this is a different CCP that, that has very tangibly decided that they want Taiwan no matter what. And so for the KMT, you know, to continue to take that as a fan and, and to continue to believe that, uh, that, that uh, you know, a friendly China policy is a good guarantor of Taiwanese security, that's just, that's outdated. It's, it's not, it's just not the case anymore. Um, so I, I see that as a very fundamental problem with the KMT. So we've talked about a lot of different aspects of China today. We've talked about the nature of its economy, about how it tries to weaponize its quasi-sanction regimes to have influence and sway over what, what people can say within the United States and other Western countries, uh, and its ambition to bring Taiwan under its own control. Clearly, the the goal should be for us to coexist and cooperate with China peacefully for us to gain from the great economic ingenuity of the Chinese economy, to be able to trade with each other in ways that make both of us more affluent and to find a world order in which we protect our political values and our freedoms without necessarily having to impose them on China. Is that realistic? Can we get to that path? And if so, how should we think about how to maximize the chances of that? Yeah, I mean, I would say that so much of that is dependent on the agency of the CCP, you know, what they choose. And I really think that the U.S. did so much for that for that world that could have been of China and the U.S. cooperating in that way. I mean, if you look at, for example, the Obama administration, they continued on this path of engagement, especially the last four years, when they shouldn't have, when... All signs within, you know, U.S. intelligence agencies were pointing to an, an, an increasingly and incredibly aggressive China. And we stayed on that path far longer than we should have and came to realize what the Chinese government was actually doing and what their ambitions actually were far, you know, very, very late. And I think that for things to change, the CCP has to change. And I don't know if, if they will. I, I really think that democracies have done as much as they can to try to bring you know China into a world order that is imperfect but that we do value. What can we do different, you know, if uh, you know, okay, even if that's true, you know, surely there are still things, I mean, on on our side that we can change to to prevent things from getting worse. And there are. And I I think that as the Biden administration is doing now and I think they're doing a pretty good job, they're not pulling their punches. They're still trying to address these these excesses or these these things that the Chinese government keeps doing that erode the rules-based order such that it exists while continuing to try to talk to to China, to Chinese officials while well, continuing to try to be the adults in the room. And I I think that is good. I I I think that The best thing that, that democracies or like-minded countries need to try now is strength, is, you know, working together, trying to push back against China in a more united and cooperative way. Because, you know, the CCP, it, it didn't have to be this way. I think if a different president had come in, other, you know, besides Xi Jinping, it could have gone differently. But it didn't. This is what happened. And he he has, you know, in, in the face of, of weakness or naivety, his policy has been to just take as much as he can. I think the the only way, the thing left to try now, 
is to try speaking with strength, speaking with power, speaking with force, not military force, but try to kind of sort of constrain China in that way. I know that that is not a very happy answer. I wish I had a better one. Bethany, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening to The Good Fight. Lots of listeners have been spreading the word about the show. If you too have been enjoying the podcast, please be like, rate the show on iTunes, tell your friends all about it, share it on Facebook or Twitter. And finally, please make suggestions for great guests or comments about the show to goodfightpod at gmail.com. That's goodfightpod at gmail.com. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Silent Partner for their song, Chess Pieces. Thank you.